we're back with Wayne Mack now, who, as we mentioned earlier, is the author of Don't Touch That Dial, Hits and Memories of Australian Radio, and he's with us here in the studio. Wayne, welcome back. Yeah, thank you, Samuel, okay. on the Persiflage Show. I always yes. want to say that on the radio. <laughs> Samuel's Persiflage. It's uh, a great word, isn't it? I love words, and that's that's a that's a funky word. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, one of those words that seems to fit. Mm, mm. Mm. Because I I looked up the the, uh, definition, and what we're doing here, we're actually, this is a persiflage. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, back to it. And uh, one thing that I have Mm. been interested in, AM radio at one stage had 10 kilohertz spacings between stations, so they would have been 1200, 1210, 1220, Mm. maybe not necessarily that close to each other, but... um, but no, but the, a, you're right. There were yeah. the, the, the ten kilohertz separ- separation. So if you use Melbourne, for example, in the you know the, the before they made the change in 1978, uh, I think you had three UZ at nine three zero, three KZ at eleven eighty, three DB was in between them on ten thirty, three XY was fourteen twenty, three AW was twelve seventy. Oh no, twelve eighty. Sorry, twelve eighty mm-hmm. for three AW. 2SM was 1270. Um, the reason that was changed, and the change came about on the 23rd of November, 1978. Now, I know I was hesitant with that date, but it's an important date because that's the that's the day 2WS went to air in Sydney. All right. Now, they went to air on 1224 AM, but had they gone to air a couple of months earlier, they would have been on 1220. Hmm. Right. Uh, and I... I have a feeling I was on the air that night when they did the changeover. I've got a strange feeling because it was, yeah. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. It was a long time ago. But the reason it was done, there was a, 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 a technical radio convention, I think, in Geneva. It's in the book on... Uh, I've lost the page. I had it marked a moment ago, but it's somewhere up the, uh, yeah. the back end of the book. It would probably be in the 70s chapter. Where we talk about... Chapter 11. Sounds of the seventies. Oh, look, you know more more than I do. <laughs> um, I should know this book back the front, but there's some things uh, you just try to put aside, and because mm. uh, uh, I can't read it like an, a, a normal reader, because I've I've seen it all before, you know, mm. coming together. Yeah. But anyway, this convention in in uh, I think it was in Geneva decided that um, uh, in about 1974, I think that uh, they put it forward a recommendation that the station should have nine kilohertz separation or the band should have 9 kilohertz separation so that you can fit more stations on. Mm. And this appealed to Australia because the the decision to go with it occurred before we had commercial FM. Mm. So it was seen to be a way of fitting fitting the stations like the 2WSs and the 3MPs and all of these kind of stations on, on onto the dial. Yeah, mm. that's why it was done. Mm. Yeah, according to the... I think it's the... Uh, Broadcasting Association's website, mm. uh, the stations are 9 kilohertz apart, but yep. they each take up 18 kilohertz of uh, frequency space just because of the, the way AM goes Oh, with air. the spill, the yeah. sideband, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a bit, yeah, it's a bit technical. Yeah. Uh, but there is a part in the book um, where I do talk about AM stereo, and one of the reasons that AM stereo was so, um, um, I suppose, problem-bound a lot of it was tied up with that sideband issue, particularly nighttime listening because yeah. of the whistle, and that's where you get that heterodyne whistle that occurs on, on AM stations at night if you're a little bit off the station. Yeah. But anyway, it's all very technical. Don't yeah. worry about that. And uh, this isn't really a technical book no, as such. No, it's more about the people of radio. Um, I think if you're a radio listener in the 60s, 70s and 80s, that you will, as you go through each page, you'll just all these names will come back to you and you'll think, oh, look, I remember these people. They were so much a part of my listening. Uh, if you were one of those people who was actually on the radio, it's a little bit like this is your life, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, You it's, haven't it's, applied for the Channel 9 show. No, yet. no, I don't think I look like anything like Mike Munro. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could end up reading Channel 9 Weekend News if that was the case. <laughs> That's been an interesting uh, thing as well, but that's um, yeah. different different kettle of fish. Yeah. 
So, so does that answer your question about the yeah, AM thing? Yeah, it does. But check yeah. it out in the book. There is a sidebar which explains the, the, why it was brought in. Mm. Um, and one station in particular, um, 2UW, wanted to, wanted to change their call letters as a consequence of changing their numbers from 1110 to 1107. They wanted to call the station uh, W110. Okay. Yeah, but it never got up. No, well, if they did that and then they tried to read telephone numbers as well and everyone would be confused. <laughs> just, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, of course, um, FM arrived later here than it did anywhere else. Yeah, uh, well, if, if you consider when we talk about anywhere else, um, you know, the Americans and, and, yeah. and the Europeans. People who generally are technically <laughs> ahead of us anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know what happened in Japan and places like that, but uh, we got it in 1980, which uh, was astounding, really, because the Americans had had it since the late 50s. But uh, I, I think the reason that, that it took so long in Australia is that we had a um, we had a problem with sets. Mm. Um, there weren't a great deal of sets in the marketplace. Let's say in the '60s, sets became more available in the '70s, and certainly by the time that FM cranked up in mid 1980, set penetration was quite high, particularly in the home. Not as much in cars, mm. but it was growing very quickly in cars. And uh, I think that this is this is an issue that um, will. Uh, cause the, the you know the current broadcast is a bit of a headache with digital radio because largely the sets are not out there. Yeah. So TGB are trying to flog yeah, them, I think. But, yeah. yeah. But you know that's that's there's a lot of work to be done. Mm. Whereas when FM hit the air, they didn't have their formats right, uh, and that caused them a, a problem because they had to settle in and, and find their way. But at least with sets, there were enough sets in the marketplace to make a difference. Mm. Yeah, very important. And of course, you you had a role in um, in Canberra's FM stations. Mm. Uh, so mm. you you were what was a program director at, at yes. Kicks? Kicks, yeah. Uh, we, that, was, that was going to be called Two Triple C at one stage, wasn't it? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, they, they, I talk about that briefly in the book about why I felt that that was a mistake. I I had been the program director of Two Double C, and I was very proud of Double C's achievements. Mm. a great radio station, but I just didn't want this new thing to have anything to do with 2 C because the kind of station that Kicks was when it opened was just, you know, chalk and cheese. Mm. You know, it was a very blokey sort of kick-ass rock and roll station and 2 C was still sort of playing, you know, Hits and Memories, Lionel Richie, Fleetwood yeah. Mac and all that stuff and it was... Yeah, ultimately uh, became Ma- a classic hit station, you know. Much like they did right through mm. to... Probably about the mid mid nineties when they started going talk. Uh, yeah, but even a little bit before the talk thing, they went through a little easy listening phase when mm. uh, the current owners bought the station. I think in ninety three or four. I'm not quite sure of those dates. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I was uh, responsible for uh, flicking the switch on that Canberra FM station. But the interesting thing about Canberra getting FM. And I should point out, in fairness, that we weren't the only station that day. There was also FM 104. Yeah. Uh, well, in those days it was called 104, but it since re- was rebadged 104.7. But mm. when it went to air, it was just 104. Both those stations went to air at the same time, on at the same day, and that was quite deliberate. Mm. Um, but it took almost eight years, and this is the unbelievable part, eight years between the first stations in 1980... Uh, that went to air in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, mm. and then those two stations in Canberra. Hey, you, could you imagine that now? No, it's no. Just, yeah. yeah. I mean, digital television has sort of been a similar debacle, but it at least seems to have hit most areas fairly yeah. quickly, yep. even if the stations are still trying to work out what each channel they can do will bring, you know. They each have different ideas of how to do that. Mm. And, mm. Uh, so yeah, I had a I had a, a Johnny come lately sort of uh, involvement in FM, mm. and it was fun while it lasted, but it didn't last very long <laughs> for me. <laughs> Only about a year. Yeah. So I suppose FM brought better sound quality, and mm. I mean, before I say that, there is going to be at least one listener who's going to tell me that it didn't because, um, well, he seems to. John B one B five, if you're listening, I know you love AM, but just for the sake of this, we're going to say FM had better sound quality. 
Well, it it did, I guess, in in terms of um, uh, FM receivers, and, and I talk about this in the book. I, I don't I don't get too technical, but it must be remembered that the the when you think of music being played on an AM radio station or an FM station, the sound actually leaves the station in the same way. There's no tricks or funny filters or anything like that. It's when the signal gets into your radio that the problem begins, and, and AM radios um, generally are just made of cheap, nasty um, equipment, mm. uh, uh, sorry, components. <laughs> um, and that's why um, AM doesn't travel very well, but the sound quality leaving an AM radio station is quite respectable. Mm. So I agree with your friend on that level. And, and I quite like, you know, because I grew up with, with AM radio, I still like that old sort of very fat sort of AM sound. You know, mm. when, a, when a station's really pumping, I, I like that sound. Some FM stations, if they're not processed very well, they sound a bit meek and mild, you know. Mm. Um, but I think the actual uh, uh, the bandwidth that, that, that the music on an FM station, the way you can hear it in an FM receiver, it's got a wider bandwidth, and that's what gives it the sound. So you can hear the cymbal taps and the yeah. high frequencies. You know, yeah. AM just doesn't allow that. So blame uh, the receivers. Yeah. I mean, John B1B5 yeah. is a... Is a retired radio engineer. So. Well, he'd know all about it. Well, yeah. Why have I told him all that? He's probably saying, "You fool! You know nothing." <laughs> well, he can he can send us an email podcast at samuelgordonstuart dot com if he wants to. That's it. Get the uh, plug in. Yes, and when you finish with that, www dot mac dot com if you want to buy the book. Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we should get yes. John Law's sponsorship bell and give it a bit of a ring. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, John. John does uh, say that uh, AM is easier to tune in, mm. especially, I suppose, on, on the sort of dial receivers because the frequency doesn't change as the sound does. It's very mm. much frequency is fixed, yes. whereas FM does change a little bit. And that probably yeah, doesn't affect the sound a bit. A bit. Yeah, yeah, it wanders. Yeah, so, it's not right there. It, yeah, yeah. Where, where most people, when they're listening to the radio, would sort of say, well, FM delivers me a bit of frequency response. Yeah, John would sort of say that the frequency changes and it's harder to tune in. So yeah. I suppose it depends what side of the fence you're on there as to how you define it. Yeah, and it, look, it depends what you're listening on. I mean, you know, I've got a bedside radio piece of crap, you know, that's used as an alarm. My wife uses it to wake up. And it, AM and FM on that thing is just, it's indistinguishable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can tell the difference in the car, of course, and... And I do get a little bit disappointed, you know, if I go on to an, an AM music station and I'm not hearing as many high frequencies because my ears now are much more attuned to FM because we've had it for so long. Mm. But, uh, no, but a, a really good old-fashioned pumping AM station, there was there was something magic about that. And, and guys of my vintage would probably say the same thing. Yeah. And I mean, talking of AM, a lot of the AM stations now are are either the, the Golden Memories type stations mm. or they're the talk stations. Yep. And talk in AM often means talkback. Yes. And that's got an interesting history too. It has, and that's covered in the book. In, chapter... Uh, well, you tell me what no. chapter is. <laughs> uh, it is chapter six. Well, I'm looking at the book. You're right. Chapter uh, six. Chapter six, which is called Hello, You're on the Air. Very good. Because that was one of the... Um, um, I mean, it, it sounds a very uh, uh, basic sort of statement to say now, but when Talkback first came on, it was like, wow, you know, people are having phone conversations on the on the wireless, and uh, this is in the '60s, and it was uh, it was quite a breakthrough, mm. um, and it certainly changed the shape of radio, uh, not not immediately, but I think we're seeing it now. You mm. know, f- forty years down the track, we're really seeing the power of talkback radio. Mm. Um, but when it first came in, it w- there was a bit of uh, fear and trepidation about uh, how it would be received. Um, and some stations did it better than others. Um, uh, some stations tried talkback formats and ditched them in six months because they didn't feel that they could sustain it. You know, two CA went through a phase of talkback, didn't they? Oh, 2CA went through a phase of everything. <laughs> Horse races, buy, swap and sell, solid gold, disco, um, you know, uh, magazine formats. They, poor old 2CA when, uh, I guess in the 70s and 80s, they just couldn't find a position. 
Mm. Um, double C was so dominant. Yeah, especially market. when Double C came. So, mm. one of, as people who listen to this podcast and people who read my website would know, uh, I'm a fan of John Kerr. And, yes, um, you are. And he was working at 2CA when 2 C opened, and he remembers that the first survey, CA were just annihilated. Well, dog's barking. Oh, well, it must have been a 2CA listener. He's just not, not very happy with uh, yeah. with what went on back then. But mm. uh, John's right. Um, you know, 2CA was, was blown to smithereens, unfortunately, for them. Um, but, you know, Double C was a very powerful... <laughs> Matty, you're a Double C listener or what? Well, she listens to 2 C around the house. We turn the radio on and it's on 2 C and... I mean, as far as she's concerned, sort of the the red box that just starts talking and won't shut up. But oh, she might be an FM listener. Maybe, maybe she listens to it in her bed at night. Triple J. <laughs> huh? Huh? Ooh, a bit of a growl there. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe she's listening to Triple M online or something. Maybe. You know, whatever. Uh, but the thing was that yeah, uh, Double C came into the market and and, and really blitzed it and and. It, it, it put 2CA in a terrible position for years and years. However, I, I must say, though, looking back on it, in 1984 and 85, um, 2CA managed to get themselves together with a solid gold format mm. uh, where they didn't play any current music at all, and it was quite, you know, that, that that was the one position that they could take against us at Double C yeah. uh, because we were playing a lot of current music. So that that was a point of difference. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so. Obviously, didn't like the solid gold format. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Uh, now, where was I going? Now, Natty's barking has kind of put me off here. No, that's all right. Move she, along with the show. On with the show. Yeah. Uh, well, John Kerr, of course, now working at Two uh, UE, and you, but not as often as he once no, was. No, down to two days a week now, mm-hmm. rather than five. But uh, you've brought in a little present for us. You've got oh, one yes. of his, his jingles from 2CA. Yes, uh, they had a jingle package recorded in the uh, in the early 60s. And uh, it's um, the, the, the actual thing that we'll hear was a package that was recorded for a lot of disc jockeys at the time. Um, you're familiar with John Vertigan from... Um, oh, oh, we've not uh, only got t- dogs. T- t- tell you what we might do. We might we'll play, take a break. Yeah, we'll play that and we'll see if we can sort out what's going on. Sounds like someone's at the front door. Uh, quite a jingle, very impressive, <laughs> and uh, we've we've sorted out uh, Natty's barking. She uh, spotted uh, an electrician at the front door and uh, had the and, wrong house, and, and, yeah, and savaged the electrician. Yes, who will be right. suing us in due course. Mm. <laughs> We're going to be in trouble. If anyone wants to help with that, they can. Don't know what help you can be, but you never know. All right, so we've been chatting with Wayne Mack, who is the author of Don't Touch That Dial: Hits and Memories of Australian Radio. Uh, available exclusively from waynemack.com. That's right. And it pretty much contains everything we've discussed so far and much more. Much, much more, as we used to say. Yeah. You know, be there, buy one, get one now, all that stuff, yeah. yeah. So so what what do you cover in the book? Uh, well, it's I guess it's fairly chronological the way it's set out that the early chapters obviously deal with you know the, the 50s and the 60s and by the time you get up to chapter 17 you're talking about the 80s 
but there are some departures along the way uh, where chapters are more specific in their subject matter rather than their time. Uh, chapter 9 on news, for example, um, chapter 13 on jingles, chapter 14 on promotions, you know, so they're, yeah. they're, they're specific subjects. Mm. Uh, chapter 14, cunning stunts, uh, yeah, top 10 of station promotions and publicity stunts, and then some. Uh, just having a flick through that, that's quite a good read. Well, there's a there's just a, a, a great uh, uh, number of, of stunts that have been perpetrated by radio stations, not only in Australia but all over the world, um, That uh, and, and some more memorable than others and some better executed than others. Mm. There was um, just... Uh, late last year, just before Christmas, I believe it was the mix station in Adelaide mm. had um, they did a, an outside broadcast from the local Westfield shopping centre's massive forty-hour sale or something. The, just one one person mm. going for the whole time, and yes. it seems in that time they've managed to get themselves plasma TVs for for in exchange for plugs for businesses and. Oh, right. What, the jocks did? Yeah, the jocks did. Oh, well, so, yeah. you know, if you're going to do an OB, you might as well make it worth it, as because there's nothing as boring as hell as working the, on OBs in as, shops. Yuck. Especially if you're sitting there for whatever it was, 40 hours straight or something. Oh, except, well, even if you're sitting there for three hours. I, I, I did some OBs from storefront windows, and oh, they're just terrible. Um, um, so you, you'll see in the book, I'm not a big fan of, of OBs. Yeah, two double C... I'm certain it was two double C uh, a few years back during uh, their trading post program. Uh, we're live from the front of probably Retrovision in, in Fishwick or something, and, mm-hmm. and they had the the store manager there telling them oh, the, doing, the doing sales, the, the sale prices, and <laughs> oh, look, you know, it's just <laughs> you know, the, look, I, I think it underlines a point that I make in the book, and I've, I make it a few times, but it's probably wise making it again, that this book is predominantly about commercial radio, mm. and there are, um, I guess, subtle differences between the style of broadcasting that you'll hear on, on public radio um, and, um, and taxpayer-funded radio, <laughs> ABC Friends, um, and commercial radio. It, 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 it is there for commercialism, Mm. It's it's a business, and 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 commercial radio is about, you know, is part of the advertising industry. It's not. I think there's the purist would have us believe that, you know, radio is there for the the greater good of something. Well, you know, tell that to the people who own radio stations. They'd tell you just get out. Yeah. Because mm. it's there. It's there to make money for the shareholders. Um, yeah. And oh, they're yeah. called, they, that's that's the that's the what they do. And the only way they can do that is to please the public to some extent so they can get a bit more money in from the advertising. And, of course, if you're not rating, then people aren't necessarily going to advertise. <laughs> Excuse me. Look, it, of course, you know, it, it's a bums-on-seats business. Mm. Um, if you've got big ratings and you can deliver those numbers to your advertisers, uh, that is really what a commercial radio station wants to achieve. Uh, if it does some good programming, if it does some great programming along the way then that is just icing on the cake. Hmm. But uh, really, that's the main game, particularly now. The, the, you know, we're very much in a, a corporate-driven sort of environment and uh, everything's bottom line focused. Hmm. Uh, looking towards the back of the book, we've yeah. got a, a rather comprehensive listing of the stations and the players. Yeah, well, what that... Uh, I, I put that on there uh, against the advice of, of some people who thought, oh, look, you know, it's just, it, it becomes like a book of lists when you get up towards the back. But I think it's interesting that, that if you were to do uh, or if you were to pick up a book on, say, um, you know, AFL or VFL it was as, as it used to be or rugby league or union or cricket or anything, tennis, uh, golf, and you look back at the teams that, were, were, were the, the, sorry, the players that made up the teams, you know, the test teams that played England or France or whatever, you see their names, you th- see their photos, you think, ah, these are the these are the people. And mm. that's why that part two is very important, so that um, if you wanted to go back, uh, I know we've talked a lot about 2CA and 2CC, but if you wanted to find out a little bit more about, say, Perth Radio, mm. because you, I presume you've never lived in Perth. No. no. Yeah. I've heard, heard Perth Radio once. You did an interview oh, with me okay. once. Oh, okay. 6PR, yeah. <laughs> but if you wanted to find out a little bit about 
the who's who of, of, of Perth Radio, you can go to maybe you know the, the six pm page, and you can go. Oh well, I, I didn't know uh, you know John Burgess worked there for all of that time, and mm-hmm. I didn't know Lionel York was there, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And you can see, um, you, you can you can basically see who, who the people were who made up the teams of radio people through the 60s, 70s and 80s in that in that second section. So it's a very valuable resource, uh, reference resource. Mm, mm. Yeah. And I'm talking of books of lists, I actually have a book downstairs uh, of VFL finals. Uh, yeah. And yeah. It, it's sort of every few years it has this page and a half of... Uh, well, this is sort of what happened during the year, and mm. and such and such took this fantastic mark in round fifteen when yeah. they played uh, so and so, but they did eventually lose to Team Z. Yeah, and then the majority of it is lists of of teams, lists of scores, yeah, well, statistics, yeah, and, and which then, are very important in sport. Yeah. And then it goes and has yeah. a few photos every here and here and there. Yeah, look, I could have I could have spent the rest of my life um, putting in things like you know. Um, rating scores and um, y- you know uh, oh, um, all, all sorts of cross, re- cross references, but I just wanted to focus on the people of the radio stations because yep. they were the ones that were important, the frontline people uh, who we heard on the air. Because mm. that's what we, when we remember a radio station, be it a great station or an also ran station, we tend to remember the people who were on the air. Yeah, I mean, sorry to all the managers out there, but we don't often remember you. Well. For good reason, because the managers, uh, in most cases, weren't known to the public. I mean, hmm. some of the great radio station managers uh, in, a, in Australian radio, guys like Alan Faulkner, who was responsible for having the Top 40 format on TUE in the late 50s, guys like him were not known to the public, hmm. you know. But but the announcers on TUE at the time, like Gary O'Callaghan or like Laws or Jeff Marshall or any of those guys, they were the ones that people remember. Hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the managers were behind-the-scenes players. Yeah, and I suppose it's fitting as a book about the people that you mm. have uh, the foreword from... Uh, I have it here. I'll have to find the page again. From Bob Rogers. Oh, yes. Dear Bob. Yeah. It um, does help when I find the right page yeah. in the book. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, he's up the front where he yes. should be. Uh, oh, look, I'm just absolutely delighted to have somebody of his standing in the broadcasting community uh, write the foreword uh, because that really puts a bit of a stamp of credibility on, on the work. Mm. Um, and he was only too happy to do it. I just uh, you know, called him up one day and I said, look, you know, I'm getting to that point where uh, I need to think about a forward and I'd like you to do it. And he says, yeah, fine. I didn't have to twist his arm or anything, you know. All right. So, so yeah. it's uh, 400 pages. Yep. It's uh, A4 in size. So you, you think 400. As you can see, there's a couple of kilos in it there. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you think 400 pages at A4 is sort of, what, 800, 900 paperback size book pages, maybe, the equivalent? No, it, it's 400 uh, leaves of, of, like, actual page numbers, like... Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I know, I'm just saying in terms of content size. Right. You're, you're sort of looking... Um, I'm looking doubtful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you were to try and fit yes. that into a sort of paperback... Uh, size oh, book. Oh, well, you'd, look, you'd, I hate to think. Um, yeah, it'd be sort of 900,000 pages, something yeah, like that. Yeah, oh, look, it'd be the thickness of a phone book or something. You mm. know? So, uh, yeah. No, this is a good size. Um, yeah. One to leave on the coffee table, and hopefully you won't spill too much coffee <laughs> on it. But uh, I hope that people enjoy it. It's been a labour of love. Um, uh, my wife's very glad that I've finished it. And uh, you know, well, you still have to pack them all, don't you? Oh yeah, I have to pack them and send them out and all that sort of stuff because it is a self-published book. I should add that too, mm. and that's why it's available through the website and not in stores. www.waynemac.com. Yes, yes. Um, you got if, an unofficial if, sponsor of this program. <laughs> if Big Kev were alive, he'd uh, he'd be very impressed with our plugging capabilities <laughs> here. But uh, yeah, it, it is. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just delighted that it's, it's out there and it's so well received. I've, I've had some terrific emails from people, and uh, uh, and the website's only just starting to get just at the beginning. Um, it'll grow with uh, more responses from people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's uh, it's great to have done it. Right. And I, I think I can leave something very tangible behind mm-hmm. uh, that will be here for many, many years when I'm gone. Yeah. 
Well, mm. I've uh, already recommended the book to my former school library who oh, might um, might find it useful in some of their media and journalism classes. Well, I did design the book that way so that it could be recommended reading. Um, as you've seen, it's not really a textbook as such, no. but I think if you do delve into it, you get a very good understanding of of what radio was doing, why it was doing it, and who the people were who were who were doing it, mm. uh, and, and also the you know the impact it was having uh, on on listeners. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's uh, it, it'd be a valuable tool, I think, um, to anyone who wants to study the history of media mm. um, or the radio media anyway in this country. Yeah. Mm. So it's uh, sixty nine ninety five. It is uh, indeed plus postage. Uh, Eight dollars for postage, but uh, for postage. Canberra people uh, have, have just been knocking on my door and <laughs> driving around and, and uh, you know saving their eight dollars, but they're probably blinded in the petrol anyway. Probably, yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah. So 60... and we'll get them out as, as quickly as we can. There's a, there's a lot to process, but um, uh, yeah, sixty nine ninety five. I think it's pretty good value for a book that size, and and it's a quality book as you can see there. Mm. The way it's been, I'm really happy with the job that they've done on it. The uh, printing firm in Canberra, Paragon Printing, they've yep. done it for us. So another another plug in there yes. for the boys. Might as well talk about a couple of the sponsors who helped it uh, get underway. Yes, I did have some sponsorship to help me. Um, the uh, Australian Film, Television and Radio School, AFTUS. Yep. Um, the, uh, they and uh, the National Film and Sound Archive, uh, part of the Australian Film Commission, they were the two major sponsors. I've also had uh, Artie Stevens' company, JA Online Services. They've helped out, so as radio-wise. This um, would be a good point in time to uh, to establish that I do have a commercial arrangement oh, yes. with uh, JA Online Services, who are the owner-operator of Australian Independent Radio News, where you can hear me on Saturday afternoons. That's it. Get that cross-plug in there. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, Paddywhack Promotional Products, a uh, mate of mine uh, over in Fishwick owns that company, and he tossed in uh, some sponsorship funding for me. And uh, who are we? Jock's Journal. Yep. Um, they're in there. And uh, have I forgotten anyone? Oh, and the, and the, uh, the great Andy Grace, who did, did mm-hmm. the website. Yes. So yeah, I'm I'm very thrilled that um, people have come on board and um, supported me in this project because it, it's something that I just uh, had to do on my own. I couldn't wait all my life for publishers to get off their bums and do something, so mm. I did it on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So more more information on that, of course, available at waynemac.com. And there's is there an email address people can contact? Oh, just there? info at waynemac.com. That's probably the 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 quickest one but if they go onto the site um, uh, you you can find uh, there's a a, a a page about me yep. and down the bottom there's an email contact there yeah. okay and of course you've got a few uh, jingle montages uh, filled with jingles similar to the one we heard a little bit earlier uh, probably a bit newer than that uh, that one we heard earlier was from 63 but most of these uh, summer jingles which are on the site at the moment they tend to be Oh, I think the earliest ones I've got on there are from the late 60s, but they're mostly mostly 70s, uh, late 70s uh, jingles from uh, uh, summers of our past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, so uh, quite an impressive book. As I look at it here, I'm, uh, I'm certainly, looking, like it. <laughs> yeah, certainly looking forward to having a good read of it. Uh, Don't Touch That Dial, Hits and Memories of Australian Radio, available exclusively from www.waynemac.com. For sixty nine ninety five, four hundred pages, A four size, hardcover. <laughs> I don't know how many more times oh, I no, can repeat look, that, but no, um, no. you've kept to the script. That's very good. Yeah. Wayne, <laughs> Mac, been a pleasure having you on the show. You too.